There we go. Awesome. Yeah. Of course, everything worked well during the tech test. It, it had to. I mean, this is just how <laughs> these Google products work, right? Thanks. Thanks for those really kind words, Adrian. That's um wow, that's amazing stuff. I'm kind of sad you confused me with someone else, but I'm I'm gonna take the credit anyway. Um uh, by the way, this is T. Really strong T. But uh yeah, we we need that when we work in this industry. I'm gonna try and hear something. Um, let's see. So because because I love Google so much, I'm going to use a real browser. Um, I take it everybody can see. All right, awesome. So what I'm going to uh, let me just get back there. Oh, this is there we go. Awesome. All right. So if you want, you can follow along with this lightning talk. Um, I've been asked to to tone down my language because I, I, I say I say strong adult words now and again, so none of that shit tonight. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a of an intro into why Google sucks and why it's important that everybody joins me in boycotting this really terrible company and what they are doing to our industry, because there's a lot of stuff where people go like, oh, Google's so great and Google said this bullshit. These guys are after our jobs, they're after our income, they're after our money, especially if you're a freelancer or a contractor. They love taking bread off your table. And I'm going to tell you how that works just now. But first, before we get there, this is um, a course that's very close to my heart, Tears, Animal Rescue. So if you, if you want to do something that doesn't suck, Get yourself a rescue dog or rescue cat. Maybe you can just donate some time or money or goods or love or something to them. Um, reach out to them. See if you can. Oh, this looks crap. Let's just fix this. There we go. It's much better. Reach out to them and see if you can make some kind of contribution. It will change your life. It will change some, something else's life. And it's really worthwhile to get involved. Um, and if you use any Google products, you really should be doing some stuff to offset that karma. So what are we going to get into tonight? So I've been a contractor and a freelancer for a long time. And through all the years, Google has come after my money all the time. Whatever I did, they came after me. Um, I'm going to tell you all about that tonight. So you can, so you can beware and you can guard yourself against these fiends. So I've got a little meme and this is how it started out, right? They were coming along and they said, we're going to kill your revenue. I was like, yeah, okay, it's, maybe it's a once off, right? But it wasn't. They kept coming back and they kept taking my money over and over and over. Um, if you want to read more about me, you can go find out. There's a little thingy there on, on, on my website where I brag about how awesome I am, but we don't have to get into that right now. So let's get into the history of how we got to this little lightning talk. There was a time before Google where things were great. Software development was complex, error prone highly specialist process where people like me could come in and charge fortunes for doing ridiculous things and designers would come and they would say oh we want to put a little 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 underscore here we want to put a drop shadow and i could just go like no i'm not spending three weeks doing that the company can't afford that go away and that's how it was and that's how it should have been and it was great but then these google guys came along and they, they, they started subtly, right? First, they came for our search engines. Before the Google search engine, we had this thing where we open a search engine page, you wait three, four minutes, maybe five minutes, you've got your weather, your news, your sports, your fashion news, everything in there. You didn't have to go to other pages. You didn't have to struggle to, to find information. It's all there on one page. All you have to do is wait a couple of minutes. Who, who, who cares, right? So they took away our search engines. They killed Yahoo and, and Dogpile and all these wonderful engines. Then they came for our browsers. This Chrome thing, right? People, people fall in love with Chrome. and They think that's the best browser out there. And da, 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 da. Now everybody's using, using Chrome. Mm, so they killed all those other browsers. Who remembers Netscape, right? But it wasn't enough. 
there was a whole bunch of us making sweet money doing React Native, which was this cross-platform thing by Facebook, you know, glorious Facebook, which allowed you to write apps for iOS and for Android without understanding either of the two. What can be better than that? Then they came with this thing called Flutter, which is faster, more performant, easier to write in, which means you can't charge as much for it. That kind of tipped me off to maybe these guys were not on my side. Next, they moved Flutter onto the desktop. There goes Electron. You don't need Electron anymore. You don't have you don't have desktop apps that consume four gigs of RAM anymore. So it's bad for PC sales. It's bad for RAM sales. It's bad for developers. It's just bad all around. But they didn't stop there. They even moved this nonsense called Flutter onto the web, killing off React. Well, uh, what's up with this? I mean, it is nothing. It's nothing sacred to them. Next up, I thought, okay, so they've killed all this cross-platform stuff. I'm going to move back into pure native development. As soon as I did that, they started this whole Jetpack Compose thing, which means that you no longer have these complicated, really difficult to, to do XML layouts on Android. You end up with something that's simple and easy to set up, which means it takes you less time to do, it's faster to develop, it looks better, you can't charge as much as you could for XML. That's unfair. And on and on and on they went. Just, just when I thought, okay, that's fine, you know, I'm going to do some swing work on the desktop because that's still very, very complicated. They go and infect the company JetBrains. You know, the guys that brought us Kotlin, the guys that brought us the IntelliJ ID, they infect them with this whole Compose nonsense. And they port Compose to the desktop. Now, you don't have to spend weeks doing UIs and Swing. You can do it in Compose. Quick and easy and simple. Um, great. That kind of got me worried. And the next thing, and I knew they were going here, they brought Compose to the web. So that means that guys like me, who know nothing about the web at all, can write stuff like this in Kotlin that runs on the web without understanding anything about what we are doing. And how does that work? Let's take a look. This is the source code for this page. Well, for most of this page. First of all, you've got this thing called the composable. It's a little annotation that does a whole bunch of magic in the background that you don't have to worry about, but it allows you to build user interfaces without complicated XML, without all these different things that you had to balance and tweak and stuff. You can now come in and say, hey, I want to build a component. I want it to render to the screen. I want it to have some properties. I want it to have state because when I move things around, I want things to change. I want to have text. And I want that text to have a particular color and a particular size. And if I click on it, I want it to change color. And that's simple and easy. And I don't know how to do this stuff in JavaScript, but I do know how to write some basic Kotlin. And as you can see, all of this is just basic Kotlin that I wrote. And it renders a web page for me. And I've got a slider, got things like buttons that react to when I click things. It just happens. I don't know how it works. I don't care how it works. It's simple, it's easy, it's quick. So I can use my Kotlin knowledge to build web pages. So we don't need those fancy web people anymore. We can get rid of them. Angular, bye-bye. We don't need we don't need Angular. We can get rid of it now, right? What I love about this whole approach that they followed, um, and this is this is IntelliJ and, and JetBrains combined. Um, nothing to do with those evil Google guys. But you can use plain old Kotlin. The Kotlin that, that we've been using, especially as Android developers, we write a lot of Kotlin code. What's cool about it is we can still use that same code. Anybody who's done Kotlin will take a look at this and go like, that is bog standard Kotlin. We can use that same code the same way we would have used it anywhere else on the web. And we can have web apps where, um, without any effort, which is bad for us consultants but you know it's probably good for the rest of the people i've got a couple of links and stuff if you if you want to if you want to explore 
the world of Compose, use a search engine like ask.com, do yourself a favor and use, use one of those. You, you won't get what you're looking for, but you will get all kinds of other interesting links. And it's, it's really a nice rabbit hole to go down to. I did a, I did a much longer talk, not a lightning talk, upon Compose for, for desktop a while ago. So there's a repo you can go check out with horrible code. It runs, but, but it's not best practice. There's a little video of the talk. There's some official resources, um, and like I said, if you go to this URL, um, you will see this app run in the browser without me knowing how to write web apps. Yeah. And that is everything. Ooh. I'm going to stop sharing now. And if there's any questions, this is your this is your opportunity. I will do a proper longer talk about this at some stage when we have time um, and when I actually know how Compose for Web works. Wow, that's, <laughs> that was pretty funny. Uh, and, and yeah, thank thank you for your talk. Yeah, that was that was really cool. Um, and, and 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 I mean, yeah, they they are really coming after your money. And I felt a little sick there when, when you came after my, 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 my React Native there. I think that there's still a place for it, uh, as frustrating a job as it might be. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit tongue in the cheek. But I mean, there's a, there's, there's a, there's a whole world out there with, with different solutions and stuff. And what's always been frustrating as, as, a, as a mobile developer is that my knowledge doesn't translate well into the React Native world, for example because it is completely different. The, 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 the way you need to think is completely different. What I, what I like about this approach is that a lot of my knowledge translates easily. Mm, mm, mm. So, so it, 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 in, it enables more people to write solutions. Not always the right solution, but sometimes all you need is a solution. That's so. true. I mean, I think that there is like this kind of you know, it's, it's sometimes a little bit hard to motivate to do full native development nowadays, right? It, it does need to start asking the question, why not just go straight cross-platform? And I guess, like you say, this Jetpack Compose for the web, it makes it a bit easier for a transition to kind of take place, I guess. Or just a prototype. Yeah. Which yeah. is which often often the thing that... that, that we end up not doing because it's too time consuming and too expensive yeah yeah yeah, yeah but um i mean it's pretty interesting stuff i mean I'm, uh, so a question from me is um as a native developer as and, and as a freelance native developer is there a shortage of work or is there an abundance of work particularly is there are there a lot of new projects coming up as native development or is it mainly maintaining existing projects it it's it's there's a definite split in what people are trying to achieve so if you are building a something i worked on very recently is a custom keyboard that's flat out native in fact that's that's c++ native not even just Kotlin native, because you, 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 when you think of a keyboard, you want it to be slick and fast and not interfere with anything, right? It comes up, you type stuff and it goes away. That's, that's what a keyboard does. So, so in that sense, native is the only way to go. But if I'm doing an app where I am doing some restaurant reviews or something like that, does native really add value? It, it doesn't because I've got forms that I'm filling in and it pushes that to the server and it displays some some data and and that's it so you don't you don't have any value that native adds whatsoever in that case I would say something like react native or flutter is far more suitable to solve that particular problem um, if it's a really complicated app native is the thing yeah. but if if you if you can't identify a reason to go native, then you should really ask yourself, is this is this what I need to do? Do I have to go native? Because most of the time the, the answer is hell no. Hmm, that's really interesting. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's something that I've been thinking about for a while. That's I mean, oh, I see, I see Mark, Mark has to jump off. Sorry, Mark. Bye bye. No, bye, Mark. Um, uh, thanks. 
Um, there is one question from um, Alex uh, uh, Stenberg. It says, um, does it use um, WebAssembly under the hood? Not yet. So right, right, now, right now it uses the Kotlin JS compiler, which basically takes Kotlin, compiles it to, to JavaScript. Um, but there are plans to introduce WebAssembly, but they are busy with Kotlin native to figure out the memory management that they're going to use for WebAssembly. And there's a whole committee around that. And there's some, there's some native memory management that's coming to WebAssembly. And once that is in place, Kotlin will be updated to use that and then Compose and things like that will, will have access to that as well. So for now, not quite. Um, you can use WebAssembly if you write some of the code in something like, let's say, Rust or, 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 in, or, or what is it? Is it, is it assembly script? One of those. Because you can interact with, with JavaScript from your Kotlin because it just becomes JavaScript in the browser anyway. So you can do that if you want to, but I, I don't see the reason uh, behind that yet. I mean, if you want to do game development, sure. But for most apps, it, it won't make a difference at the moment. But there are plans. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it because I've got some Android apps I want to port to the web, but I need WebAssembly for the especially image and video processing. I hope that answers your, your question, Alex. Uh, Chad, if it doesn't, um, I'm, I'm just wondering, so is it, is it, will it be easier to do so porting a certain language into WebAssembly because WebAssembly, I think is C++, right? Or uh, most people do C++ or so the C sharp? Rust. 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 Yeah. And, yeah. And because Rust is object oriented, right? No, funny enough, not. It's 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 more functional. It supports some object oriented stuff, but it the, the thing that I like about WebAssembly is it's it's really language agnostic. So it's 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 just assembly code that it pushes out that gets mm -hmm. run. So the LLVM compiler can push out a lot of the the byte code then that gets run. So there's there's WebAssembly. Um, Compilers from Python, from C++, from JavaScript, from TypeScript. Um, from There is a Kotlin one as well, but they are deprecating it and, and retiring it because it uses a very cumbersome memory management model, which which means that once you start using WebAssembly, it's actually slower than just writing it in JavaScript because it's it's just it's just clunky, um, and, and that's not that's not what we want. So. I'm I'm excited to see WebAssembly changes that's going to come in the next year or two because they're working on WebAssembly itself to have native memory management um, processes, which means that you don't have to worry about that anymore. So you can just tie into whatever the platform does, which is which is going to enable a lot of people to to target WebAssembly. Oh wow! 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 I'm wondering if there are any languages that that cross compile better into into Rust and WebAssembly, and and I know I know there's a subset of TypeScript. I think they call it Assembly Script or something. That is ridiculous. Okay, the the, the things they do in that is just insane. Wow. Um, the best demos I've seen has been in Rust, um, because because of the way Rust uses memory management and how it works with the safety and everything that you don't have all this massive allocation and deallocations that happen. So it, it just translates naturally to WebAssembly. But uh, I'm, 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 I'm very curious to see what's going to happen over the next year or two with those standards becoming um, accessible in all the browsers. So because that's, that's going to be game changers. I think that will be a game changer. Definitely something to keep an eye on for sure. Um, yeah. All right. I uh, don't see any additional questions. Um, cool. We can go have more tea. Yeah. 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 Exactly. exactly. But yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Evalta. I really do appreciate your time and your insights as always.